know, uh, this week I've had this scripture going around in my head all week, and it's the, the, the scripture in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26, and it simply says, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Church, I want you to understand that we have come into church today and there's some things that surround your life that feel like they're a little bit impossible. But we're in an environment today that would strip back the natural because the natural is how we think as a man and we would position ourselves for what is possible in the supernatural. It's fantastic to see a a, a building that is filled here, but I want to tell you it's just the beginning of what God wants to do. You know, we're going to build an incredible cathedral here in Manchester, but even that is just the beginning of what God is going to do. So church, I want you to understand you're an environment environment today where anything can happen. Why? Because there's no limitations when we're in God. And today I want to talk to you on the topic, if you want to write it down, it's called New Horizon. New Horizon. You see, the truth is that a horizon is an interesting thing. You know, it speaks when we think of the horizon of possibility. It speaks of freshness. It speaks of something new. But do you know that visually the only place where we actually see the possibility of heaven colliding with earth is found in an horizon. And we need to recognize that that is the place of infinite possibility, where earth, where natural, where man would collide with supernatural, with God. And as we stand together, we go from a place of just seeing what is possible with man, which sometimes seems like it's impossible. But I tell you, when God comes into the equation, we draw a line in that and we step across it. Suddenly, we go into the place of possibility. So today, I want to stir you to realize that God God is wanting you to believe beyond what you currently believe today. Today is a day of new horizon, new horizon. You know, I I hear that you've been doing a, a whole heap of stuff on financial wholeness. And you see, you can actually talk about that. Pastor Glenn got up here. I was at Chester and they're talking about doing some life groups that are specifically focused around uh, financial wholeness and foundations and helping people to budget and do th- little thing, uh, different things like that. And if you're not careful, you can actually process the words of financial wholeness through the, the, the filter of, oh, if we do this, then we get that. And there's some truth in that, but I don't want you to be limited in that thinking because you need to understand, Pastor Glenn didn't just come to you and say, we're going to have a series on financial wholeness and that's the end of that. And we're going to do some practically minded things. No, it's a declaration over your lives. So it's not just what we're going to do. You need to understand that if you'll appropriate it in your life, you will actually live financially whole once and for all. Not keep going back to the old patterns, not keep living according to the limitations, but you will go from the impossible, debt, problems, never being able to manage money to suddenly living in the infinite possibility of the supernatural increase of God. We need to recognize that it's what we appropriate. It's not just a series. It's a word that's been declared over your church today. Appropriate that you will live in that sense of financial wholeness. If you've got a Bible, you can turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 5. And as you're turning there, a few years ago, in fact, a lot of years ago, Leonie and I decided we'd start a church. And at the same time we decided we'd start the church, we wanted to move house from where we were living. We owned that house, well, we owned it in conjunction with the bank. And we sold that house and we decided we were going to buy a house right in the area where we were actually going to live, uh, where the church was going to be, so we could be a part of the community. And uh, so we sold the house and, uh, and then we decided to start the church and it was sort of at the segue just before we started the church and we also made the decision that we were going to live by faith. And I don't know if you've ever been to a bank manager and sat down with him and when you say to him you have a deposit, that's a good start. He thinks, well, okay, you've got some money. I'd, had an, I'd already had a, a, a mortgage with this particular bank called the ANZ Bank, the Australian New Zealand Bank, one of the biggest banks in Australia. 
So I already had financial credibility with them. But when it came to the part of how are you earning your income and how long have you been employed, the first part of that was, well, I haven't been employed because we're about to be employed. And how are you going to earn your income? I made the statement, I'm going to earn my income by faith. Who knows? Bank managers don't trade on by faith. If you're a bank manager here today, you need to be saved in Jesus' name. Not really. But the truth is that that's not how that system works. And I sat with him and he looked at me quite blank and vaguely and said, what does that mean? And have you ever tried to actually explain to an unsaved person what by faith actually means? It sounds like lunacy. That's the point. Your natural colliding with your supernatural. And anyway, I sat in the room and... I could tell him everything under the sun. I didn't get a yes and amen like I'm getting from you. I got a blank look and a stare and said, sorry, the ANZ Bank won't be lending you any money. (laughs) But at that moment, I could have decided that my natural position was that I couldn't lend any money, that I couldn't buy a house, that I wasn't able to go through with what I felt was what God's purpose was for my family and my life. So we made the decision, Leonie and I, that every weekend... Until we got this sorted out, we were going to go and look at new homes. So we'd get on, you know, now you can get online back then in the paper and you'd look at all the houses that were for sale and we'd walk through houses and we'd go, this is a great house. Primarily new build houses and we'd walk in, see this plan, I love this house. But who knows that after 26 applications to different financial institutions over the next six months and rejection on the basis of living by faith that we were a little bit tested. But every Saturday morning we went through the house because we said, by faith, we're going to keep trusting God. By faith, we're going to keep positioning ourselves. By faith, we're going to keep saying it's going to happen. I got into this particular house. In fact, it was the fir- one of the first houses we went into and I loved this place. It was my favourite and I kept believing this was going to be the place. I walk in and there was a salesman there. I'm going to pretty much write everybody off in this service, the bank manager, the salesman. But the salesman was full of optimism. And he said to me, sir, do you like this house? I said, I love this house. It's my favorite. He said, well, why don't you buy it? He said, do you have a deposit? I said, yes. He said, why don't you buy it? I said, because financial institutions won't lend me money. And he said, why? And I told him, and I don't think he understood either, but he's a salesman, so he didn't really listen. (laughs) He sat me down and he said, I have a friend. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've heard it all before. Who knows that you can still be believing by faith, but you can be tested in that. You can be, God, are you really going to come through? Is this ever going to happen? Hundreds of houses later, 26 mortgage applications, nothing seems to be happening for me. Now I've got a salesman telling me he's going to sort it out. I don't even know if I want to waste my time. Tuesday morning, I was there Saturday, I get a phone call. It's his friend who is the head of a building society. I don't know if you have them here, building societies. You do? Okay. And so it's a smaller type setup. And, and this guy rings me and he says, Sir, my friend's told me about your plight. We talk about it. And he says, I think we can help you. I'm thinking, wow, I like this organization. And, uh, and in the end, he signs me up. And sure enough, we're going towards the process of getting a loan. But who knows that when you've been battered in your faith, you're actually waking up every day thinking, oh, I wonder if it's going to happen. Until I get that house, until I get it signed, until the money's in my bank, will it really happen? And so sure enough, a week out from getting the loan all transferred, I get a phone call from this guy. He says, sir, there's a complication with your loan. And instantly my response, without a word of a lie, was, oh, I knew it. I'm telling him, live by faith, and now I'm telling him, I knew it. (laughs) And he says, no, 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 it's okay. He said, what's happened is our building society has been bought out by one of the big banks. I'm like, oh, no. He said, so give me a week. Well, the next few days you'll receive some papers. When you get it, fill it out, send it back. Nothing will change. They've guaranteed they're going to take over everybody's mortgages and applications. So three days later, I get in the post, this whole piece of paperwork. I open the letter, and as I look, guess what's stamped at the top? ANZ Bank. (laughs) One week later, I received the full transfer of money. My loan was approved from the original bank that I went to. 
You see, you need to understand something. With man, it's impossible. Oh, but we serve a God. We serve a God of the impossible. And today we're going to awaken something in the impossible. Luke chapter 5 and verse 1 says, One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, a great cow pressed into him. That was a crowd, by the way, not a cow. <laughs> wow. A great crowd pressed into him to listen to the Word of God. He noticed two empty boats, two empty people, two empty vessels, two empty, two empty boats at the water's edge. For the fishermen had left them and they were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out in the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But, but, this is all you need to have this morning, church. But, if you say so. Oh, is there some people in this place with, if you say so, Lord. Is there some people in this place? Because I tell you, all you need is a morsel. All you need is a little um, fragment. And if you've got that faith, oh, what can happen when your natural collides with his supernatural? When your new horizon is developed? If you're online here today, I want you to understand that God can come even into that room right now and something supernatural can begin. Master Simon replied, we worked hard all night. Didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, let the nets down again. At this time, the nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought the partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus. And he said, oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Today I want you to understand that we are on the precipice of a new horizon. We are standing at a point where there's a line being drawn and we can live in our natural or we can step across into the supernatural. Today, this story speaks symbolically, metaphorically of our own lives and the decisions that we make to position ourselves to live a life full or continue to just go on with the struggle. Today, we appropriate the words of God over our lives. We believe that, God, you're about to do something in our finances. God, we believe that you're about to do something in our health. God, we believe you're about to do something in our personal lives. And we appropriate the words in our life. But we read here that first and foremost that Peter did something that, you know, here's Jesus. He's, he's, he's really, you know, speaking to a crowd. They're pressing up to him so much he's about to go into the water. He sees an empty boat, which is Simon Peter's, and he jumps in the empty boat. He goes out and he preaches. But then the story begins because he doesn't just put the, shore, the, the boat back on the, on the shore. I want you to understand something, that when Jesus' touch comes upon you, it doesn't go back to the way that it was. You need to understand that when he's touched something of your life, oh, it doesn't stay the same. This morning, if we could just have a touch from Jesus, if we could just have him come and come into our situation, come into our setting, bring a change to our life, oh, it'll never be the same. And so Jesus is here on the shore and, and, and he says to Peter, take your boat out. It seems like a logical thing to say, push it out into the deep. But actually, it's incredibly illogical because in those times, the fishermen didn't fish in the deep. They fished in the shallow water. They'd throw their nets over the boat and the nets would nearly touch the ground. The schooling of the fish would run in such a way that they would hit the nets. But if you went out in the deep, if the fish would be under the nets and you wouldn't in the natural catch anything. So here he is and he's being told to, to go out into the... Awesome, thank you, thank you. 
So just be careful. Sometimes I look down at my notes, don't take a photo then because the double chins kick in, okay? <laughs> But here we need to understand that he's talking about the deep. And metaphorically speaking, he's talking about being fully submerged into a place that's suddenly out of our control, into a place where trust and great faith is required. Because the natural is saying, you don't go out into the deep if you're going to catch fish. He's a fisherman. He understands what to do in business. You don't go out and do that deal over there because that's not how the business world works. But we traverse beyond what is the natural. We understand that there's limitations in the natural. But oh, when it comes to the supernatural, there are no limitations. We lift ourselves out of that place and into God's purpose. So let's, as a church, make a decision that we're going into the deep. We're not going to stay in the shallow. We're going to go into the deep. We're going to go according to God's purpose and plan for our life. And that's going to mean it's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to be out of control. We're going to be fully submerged. But church, I want to urge you today, let's go into the deep. Let's go beyond where we've ever been before. Let's determine that God has a great supernatural plan beyond where we're living today. But the second thing, and if you're watching online, you're a part of what's happening right here. And Maybe the reason you're not at church today is because there's a struggle. Maybe you're here in this room and there's a struggle. But today I want to declare to you that the struggle is over. Prophetically, the struggle is over. We are a house that is purposed to be a house of help, a house of hope. This house is here because as you come in, what you feel is not just a, a sort of a presence, but what you feel today is a sense of hope. Something's starting to rise that says, my natural looks like it's not gonna work out, but oh, I'm stepping across the line. I'm going into the new horizon and suddenly something is starting to rise. There's a sense of hope. I declare the struggle is over today. You see, Peter, first thing that he has to deal with is, I was out all night. Night speaks of struggle. Night speaks of strain. It's stress. You might have come in here with that today, but we're going to dare to believe that you're going to leave without it. Nothing changes, but everything changes. The struggle is over. Peter says, we were out all day. The Bible says they were tending to their nets, getting them cleaned up. They hadn't caught anything. It says yesterday, which symbolically speaks of what was. But we need to recognize there is a what is. Last night is yesterday. Church, it's over. It's over. We're not just speaking about financial wholeness because it's a topic. We're speaking about it because we're making a declaration that that's what's over your life. If you'll just appropriate that, God is going to release you of what has been a pain for many, many years. You go, but I don't understand finances. You don't have to. You just have to understand my God and he's going to come through in your circumstance. Today, we declare it is over. The struggle is over. It is behind us. And for us to appropriate what God is saying, we need to recognise that that was yesterday. But oh, it's a promising new day today. And the thing that we understand about this scripture is then Jesus is really offering Peter a new day. He's offering a new opportunity. But for him to do that, he has to say, if you say so. If you say so, okay. I'll keep walking through the houses every weekend. I'll keep believing you. I'll keep trusting you're gonna come through. I don't understand it, but I'm gonna keep holding on because I believe that my natural is about to collide with a supernatural and infinite possibility is gonna be my portion. Boats full. I don't know about you, but here's a problem. Oh, if I hit that that hard again with my ring, that could shatter into a million pieces. But here's a problem. Over here, the boats are empty. Over here, there's nothing happening. Over here, it's, you know, wow, we can't even make an income because that's what they were, fishermen. So they needed to make their finances. They needed to make, you know, ends meet. And they're sitting, tending to their nets, but really frustrated. Jesus, at his word, we don't just sing songs like prophesy because they're a good song and they sort of make us feel good. This is real, folks. 
In church today, it's real. I'm not up here saying, I declare something over your life because I'm just saying it because it sounds good. I believe it. The word is full of it. And so we need to recognize that we're saying, well, that's over. That season is over and emptiness is gone. What was dead is going to dissipate. What is behind us is behind us. And we're walking towards what God has purposed for us. So suddenly we're going out into the deep. We're out of control. That's a good place to be. We're feeling like what's there, but all we're doing is operating on a word. Jesus said, go into the deep. They dropped the nets. In the natural, it shouldn't happen. But in the supernatural, because they cross the line, suddenly they've got nets full. They pull it into the boat. And the boat, suddenly, the Bible says, is what? It's The nets are tearing and the boat is almost sinking. So get this. Pastor Glenn said it when he was talking in the offering. Problems are merely the place of opportunity. Whether you're in a bad place and nothing seems to be happening, that's a problem. But now you've got a net full and it's tearing and your boat's about to sink. Guess what? That's a problem. I don't know about you, though. I'd prefer to be in the, my boat's full than my boat's empty. I'll take that every day of the week and work out that problem. But what do they do? And here, this is the word of the Lord. I believe this is critical today. If you've just joined the church recently. If you're online and you're not coming to church, you need to hear the word of the Lord. The enemy's great plan is to isolate us. The enemy's great plan is to not tell anybody because we're going through a hard time. The enemy's great plan is to always go, but if people knew my problem, they wouldn't like me. Trust me, we've all got them. Every one of us in the room. Every one of us in the room is challenged at some area, some part of our life. But actually, that's the whole point. And here, the thing that they do is they actually call for their partners. Church, I want you to understand that we don't put on life groups for the sake of putting them on. We put them on because we want people to break out of isolation. We want people to break away from trying to do it alone. God's purpose is that we would stand together, iron sharpening iron, saying, yes, Lord, I'm going to step into your plan and purpose for my life. Calls in the partners. And suddenly their boat is full, but there's enough to fill another boat. And then they struggle together to get all the fish to the shore. I love the analogy of this. But you see, one of the problems that we have is we're making a declaration today that it's a new day. It's a new horizon. We're making a, a statement today that we're stepping from our natural across the line of the natural, the horizon, and into the supernatural. We're going from a place where we were trusting in our own capacity, our own ability, our own understanding of how to catch fish, how to do what we do. Now we're saying we're going to abandon that to step into the deep water and do what God has called us to do. So now we're stepping out of that. But there's, there's going to be challenges. A few years ago, in sitting in a meeting and Pastor Russell asked me the question. He said, Neil, I'm really feeling that we are called, and we've been talking about it for a number of months, to disciple nations. And he said, I really want you to head it up. This is my first thought without a word of a lie. Missions. Now, some people in the room, you might love missions. I love missions, so don't hear that in the wrong context. But as a leader, missions is always a struggle. When I grew up as a kid, you know, we would support about 38 missionaries with about $3.50. And we would send them, there was jokes about send them the used tea bags, but some churches, I don't think that was a joke, I think that was happening. And the problem with missions is missions is always raise money, raise money, raise money. Missionaries have always got to raise money, and they seem to spend 80% of their life raising money, not doing the 100% of what they're called to do. So I got called to this and I started to think, this isn't just missions, this is missions on steroids, discipling nations. <coughs> I don't want to be a part of something that's always struggling and trying to find money. God, what are we going to do? So I started to ask God what we should do. And I started to allow him to speak to me about my natural colliding with his supernatural and doing something that hadn't been done before, but his purpose was there. The book of Psalms says, ask of me. And I'll give the nations. But it hasn't happened, church. I'm not being negative, but the truth is we've seen little pockets of good things happen here and there, but we've never really seen nations one to Christ. So I started to get this morsel in my spirit. I started to realize my inability in the area. 
and I did a silly thing. I wrote to the Prime Minister of a nation, Papua New Guinea. To my amazement, he wrote back. And he said, come and see me. I want to talk about what you think the solution is to bring change to my nation. And I started to think, I don't have a clue. <laughs> but you've invited me, I better go. But the real dilemma for me was I don't want to live in the world of the struggle. I don't want to live in the world of the lack. I don't want to live in the world of how are we going to do this? I, you know, the unrighteous man has stored up for the righteous, the Bible says, but I haven't always seen it, God. It's no different to my struggle with believing for the house week in, week out as I keep getting rejected. And no di it's bigger numbers, but no different. But some of you today are in the place where I declare the struggle is over and you go, how can it be? Because you've got to step out of your natural into your supernatural. So in October 2015, I got on a plane. This is where we landed just two years later in August 2017. Just watch this video. 2015, God spoke to us about playing a part in discipling the nation of Papua New Guinea. He gave us a word, believe. And with that word, we walked into a country we had never been to before. But as God went before us, doors flung wide open in every sphere and we encountered divine favour and such incredible influence. This August, we brought almost 300 people to P&G to impact the spheres of leadership, education, business, health and the church. We sent teams to three different regions. In Port Moresby, the nation's capital, we ran regional rallies and saw over 5,000 people attend and witnessed 1,500 decisions for Christ. In the region of Ley, over 20,000 people came out to our rallies and over 3,000 people were led to Christ. In Kimbe, we saw 25,000 people attend across three nights with 8,000 making decisions for Christ. Many were healed and delivered and set free. Throughout those two weeks, our teams also went to primary schools, secondary schools, prisons, hospitals, and halfway houses, carrying the love of Jesus and the redemptive power of the gospel. Our primary schools team went into 45 schools and were able to speak to 48,600 children. Our teams also visited 28 high schools and ran our program with about 25,000 students. The response to the message was also overwhelming as young people made a stand to change the future of a generation, making a commitment to change the way they spoke to and treated one another. In each region, we visited the prison there and saw almost every prisoner give their life to Jesus. The trip finished with the night celebrations in the National Stadium, where we saw over 200,000 people attend and over 110,000 respond to the message of the gospel. Thousands healed and miracles as we stood with the people of Papua New Guinea to lift up the name of Jesus and declare a new chapter for the nation. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been touched by the power of God. Every missionary has returned with a testimony, a story to tell of lives changed. We believe that a nation is turning to Jesus. We believe it will be saved. Financial wholeness, how can it be for me? The church put on these events over $1 million, so 600,000 pounds. But somehow we made a profit over 100,000 pounds. We never set out to make a profit, we just had people giving money. On Friday of this week, I go to Portugal one of the wealthiest men on earth found out about some of the things we're doing. We want to build 300 community centers called community hubs. They reach all the elements we're talking about. They cost over half a million Australian dollars each. When he found out about it, he said, I'd like to sponsor the first hundred. And potentially on Friday, he's going to write a check for 50 million US dollars. But you see, I can live in the problem. I can live as a man that says, with man, it's impossible. Yeah. Or I can step across 
into a new horizon. I can understand that there is a God who is infinite possibilities ahead. And today I declare over you, it's a new horizon. It's a new day. It's a new opportunity. It's a day to dare to believe where you've ever been before and step into the possibility God has for you. See, it's as simple as this. You look at me and you go, wow, that's incredible. One staff member. There's a hundred staff at Planet Shakers. I've got one other staff member in me. We put that on. I actually don't know how it happened. I'd like to stand up here and go, I'm so intelligent. Some of the stuff I speak to governments and leaders about, I think, wow, where did that come from? They're like, wow, that's a great new footprint. Let's use that. Thinking, great. Don't know what the next plan is. God! No different to you. Maybe bigger figures, bigger numbers, no different to you. You see, you need to understand what happened in this story. What really took place is what was empty was filled. But you can't fill something that's full. You gotta first be empty. God, my finances are all over the place. God, I need a healing. God, I don't know what to do. That's a great place to be. Peter, when he catches all the fish, a professional fisherman understands who he is, understands what God's got purposed for him. Falls to his knees, didn't stand on the shore and go, look what I've done. Falls to his knees and says, God, I'm a man full of sin, I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, that's exactly who I need. We don't need to be superheroes, church. We just need to be people that will say, I'll empty myself. An empty boat, but it wasn't just emptiness. Because that's the natural. It was when a boat was touched by Jesus. There was the first step of it being filled. Notice the second boat was filled with fish, but only because they called their partners in. The boat that was supernaturally filled and overflowing was the one that had been touched by Jesus. So today, if you want financial wholeness, today, if you want a healing from God, it starts with you acknowledging there should be nothing there. In my weakness, you are made strong. So rather than struggling and striving, why we go into isolation is because we're scared. What will other people think? In a church like this, we should think, hey, this is a place where I can be broken. Hey, this is a place where I can be empty. Hey, this is a place where I can reveal that I don't know what I'm doing. And that's the starting ground for Jesus to jump into our boat, touch us and move from the place of being empty to suddenly being filled. There's a word being spoken over your church. It's only going to happen for you if you appropriate. You say, yes, God. But it doesn't start by saying, am I ready? None of us are ready. Readiness starts when we say, I am nothing. God, would you fill me? I am empty. I am broken. But oh God, I'm available. Please use me. The interesting thing is Peter, who I love in the Bible, I'm thankful that he's in the Scriptures because he gets it wrong every stinking time. He runs away, he tells the wrong thing, he argues with Jesus, he jumps out of a boat and sinks. Hey, but he walked as well. But he was always prepared to say, Jesus. And one touch filled his boat. So here's what we've got in this room today. A whole heap of people that are trying to be filled, trying to look like we've got it together, trying to feel like something's happening, something's going on. But yet struggling to pay the credit card debt, struggling to wonder how we're going to get through that health challenge. Marriages that are nearly there at times and thinking, oh, how am I going to get through? Kids that we've put so much into and we're like, what's going on with them? You're perfect candidates to say, here I am, empty. But I tell you, we stand on the line of a new horizon, a dawning of a new day, a fresh opportunity where we would understand that with man, it's impossible. But with God, 
all things are possible. In this room right now, I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond. You stand up wherever you are. In a moment, you can walk to the front. I don't care what you do. But if you say, I want to be emptied. There's some stuff in my boat I need to get rid of. I'm weak, I'm broken, but if that's the criteria, I'm ready. And I'm going to pray that we have a touch from Jesus. Nothing changes. Oh, but everything changes. If you say, God, use me. God, touch me. God, my boat is empty. God, I feel alone. God, I I need you at this time. God, would you come through? God, I want to appropriate the word, whatever the case may be. Right where you are, come on, stand to your feet, lift your hands. Say, that's me. Touch me. Touch me. Touch me. Oh, God, touch me. Touch me, God. Touch me. Touch me. Touch me. Touch me, God. Oh, God. If you say so, if you say so, if you say so, Church, I'm actually just a mess right now. I preached this in Chester and I preached it at Planet Shakers. Oh, there's something profound happening here right now. Oh, there's something profound. This didn't happen last time. This didn't happen the other times. God wants to do something. It's a new day. It's a new day. You got to step into it, step across it. It's a new day. You don't have to walk out of these doors. The same. It's a new day. Something's happening right now. He's here. He's here. Oh, he's here. Just 
one touch, just one touch. I was out the back, so I didn't totally hear it, but Pastor Glenn joked about 70% of the people when he was doing this offering. I actually felt, just as I was there right now, that if those 70%, maybe it wants to be 100% now when I'm going to say what I'm going to say, but step across the line, allow their natural to collide with the supernatural. I tell you, I, I, I feel like a download from heaven right now. I'm going to pray. But the windows of heaven are going to open, particularly in the area of finance. He talked about 70% of the people would love an increase or love a change or whatever it might be. It's a whole story that's going on in Brian and Leone's life right now of supernatural financial increase. It's hard to explain, but there's something happening to us. And, and it's just so supernatural, you can't explain it in the natural. I only say that, give you that little morsel to say, it's possible. I've been living in this thing my whole life, three, four generations. But suddenly something's starting to shift. And the only thing that I've done different is said, I empty myself. I feel totally inadequate with what you've called me to do right now. But God, even in my inadequacy, I'm going to step over the line. I'm going to step, I'm not going to have one foot either side of the line. Where in the natural, the horizon is that place where the earth collides with heaven. I'm stepping out beyond my earthly connection. For man, it's impossible. But with God, it's impossible. And rather than just having a survey of hands of 70% of the crowd, I want people who dare to believe that God can open the windows of heaven. Oh, when they started to talk about a series on financial wholeness, I don't know that they actually expect Pastor Glenn and the uh, the team as what's about to happen, but I get a sense, a wave of supernatural blessings about to come. Uh, This is not what I planned, church. There's something in the atmosphere. It's pregnant right now. And I tell you, there's promotions. There's money coming from the east and the west. There's going to be a shift in the atmosphere, not just in your church, but over the church in England, where it's been held back. There's something going to be released, freedom and liberty. I speak it into being. If you're watching online, you watch. God's about to do something. And right now, if you're in that place where you say, God, God, I empty myself. Would you fill my boat? I want you to lift your hands. And God, right now, I pray that you would just begin to release something supernaturally, Lord, on people's lives, on this nation. Lord, where it once was a powerhouse for financing the earth, it would be it again in the supernatural world. God, I pray, release finances, release finances, release finances, release finances. Liberty and freedom, debt would go. Oh, in the name that is above all names, I pray that there be a new line drawn in the sand. Oh, something is shifting in the atmosphere. Oh, a touch, a touch, a touch from Jesus. Do it.